Christmas mortality after all. Those stories and more coming up on CNN Monday Morning. Good morning. You're on a live pre-dawn shot of the World Trade Center and that little uh, red gizmo in the lower right-hand corner above the Futures Bug. That would be the Travelers Building, which is their headquarters. We're looking south from our studios on the 20th floor of Five Penn Plaza across the street from Madison Square Garden on a Tuesday morning, 6.01 Eastern Daylight Time. I'm Jack Cafferty. This is CNN Monday Morning. I didn't hear a boom before that. I just heard very loud jet engine noise. Okay. Probably because it was so low. Right. Losing altitude. And it was losing altitude at the time. Mm -hmm. An Airbus uh, A320 style or a Boeing 737. Okay. Where do you get your uh, your knowledge from? How much time do you have uh, in a, in a oh, pilot? Oh, there's another. Oh, oh no. Okay. Explosion. To give us just a, a different vantage point, just to, to try to gain a little bit of perspective. And there you can see the situation. Unbelievable, ladies and gentlemen. As, as we are in shock as much as you are. Yeah. <laughs> hours, it was just a rumor. Somebody just called and said that on CNN, a second plane just crashed into. Oh, one stop of it! A oh, second plane. Wait, that's two different buildings. Look at that Howard building. Building. In parts one and two, we covered the September 11 attacks on talk radio and WCBS2 News in great lengths to show that there have been numerous urban myths perpetuated in 9/11 truth that not only isn't true but didn't happen. We focused on the campaign of future U.S. President Donald J. Trump mainly naysayers and defenders of his thousands of Muslims cheering in New Jersey claim, particularly from New York Police Commissioner Bernard Carrick. We also continued to show that the alleged vehicle packed with explosives on the George Washington Bridge was actually misreporting based on the authorities still investigating the white van of the five dancing Israelis, a.k.a. the High Fivers, that were all part of a New Jersey move and storage service titled Urban Moving Systems that reportedly turned out to be a Mossad Israeli intelligence front company. Basically, we corrected or readdressed the real celebratory incidents both at the Doric Towers and Liberty State Park in New Jersey, especially from ABC News. As a consequence of Trump's controversial campaign statements in 2015, the ABC News Go website released a rare archive of broadcasts. It included an evening report from 11.28 p.m. on September 11th, made available for the first time, with reporter John Miller adding additional details, basically correcting the GW Bridge fiasco and Jersey Police Bolo for the arrested high in their urban moving systems van in the Meadowlands. Although we've seemed to correct some of the Don's Jersey celebratory claims, or at least underline part of what details he read from the 2001 Serge Kovlaski Northern New Jersey Draws Prober's Eye article by the Washington Post at Trump's campaign rally in 2015, and that like sourcing and similar to the WAPO article, only one mainstream media outlet also referenced a 2001 article in order to bring some clarity or vindicate the celebratory remarks made by the Republican hopeful at the time, Trump. Bill O'Reilly and others in Fox News cited a September 13th New York Post article that describes roadside celebrations, or what could perceivably be parking lot celebratory incidents, specifying occupancy occupants with an urban moving systems vehicle but at Liberty State Park. But to address the question we left off in part two, despite the impossibility of large celebratory gatherings throughout Jersey City by the thousands, all of which would have been physically impossible for public and live media coverage to ignore, and despite Trump's references and whatever defenders of his Arabs or Muslim celebrations that also minorly details and mentions what turns out to be controversial arrests of Israeli spies after 9-11, when considering September 11th under a limited scope by the official story or commission report, New Jersey certainly plays a major part in the 9-11 attacks because of the hijacking of United Airlines Flight 93 departing out of Newark Airport. So considering all of this, even in small numbers, was there any truth to Trump's version of celebratory incidents in Jersey City? And if it was, what does it say about demographics? Or better yet, what does it say about demolitions? Being that the first conspiracy to destroy the Twin Towers basically rose out of Jersey City. Could alleged celebrations from there be the echoes of Bojinka? But, in trying to unravel, correct, or figure out how Trump may have been mistaken, we also covered the infamous news footage of Palestinians celebrating in the West Bank on 9-11 after the Twin Towers were totally destroyed. And speaking of Palestine, as you may recall from Part 1. Truce talks between Israel and the Palestinians will not be held today as scheduled. They were put off in a dispute over where to hold the talks and after Israeli troops today fired in the West Bank town of Jenin. Seven Palestinians were injured. Israel says the town was the staging ground for Palestinian terrorist attacks. 
However, what occurred on the day of 9-11, simultaneously in Israel, Palestine, and elsewhere overseas, especially earlier, such coordinated suicide attacks that were real threats shouldn't be discarded or overlooked, because even such instances of foreknowledge are real. For example, employees at the Manhattan office of the Israeli text messaging service Odigo were known to receive warning signs and told to stay away from New York in the early morning of September 11th. This obscure claim seemed to take a life of its own, morphing into ridiculous accusations of 4,000 Jews not showing up to work at the World Trade Center on 9-11. Although we like to remind viewers about film quality and financial support in our documentary making endeavors, that be archival sources with what's available and thoroughly chronicalized in Understanding 9-11, a television news archive, week-long time window from archive.org. Officially, all the network collections start as early as 8 a.m. on September 11th, but outside the calendar collection on archive.org, early recordings from the same network archive sources that were not displayed are also available. As with the opening example in this part of the film series beginning at 6 a.m. with CNN, we are lucky enough to show you Money Morning with Jack Cafferty with a last morning view of the Twin Towers in the Manhattan skyline. It's where we begin in the Middle East this morning where Israeli tanks surrounded the West Bank town of Jenin earlier today. Gun battles broke out between local gunmen and Israeli forces, leaving several Palestinians wounded. Israel says it sealed Janine because it was the staging ground for dozens of attacks by Palestinian militants. Meanwhile, truce talks tentatively set today between Palestinian leader Yasser Arafat and Israeli Foreign Minister Shimon Peres. They have been postponed. CNN provided about the only U.S. or domestic coverage of the Israeli attacks going on in Janine just hours before the attacks on 9-11, but it seemed more so to pick up coverage internationally as what we're luckily able to grab from Understanding 9-11, a television news archive. And good morning, everyone. We begin in the Middle East, where the latest truce talks have been put on hold before they even began. Israel's Foreign Minister Shimon Peres and Palestinian leader Yasser Arafat were scheduled to get together today. Now a Palestinian spokesperson says those meetings won't take place until later this week. Israeli helicopters are in the skies over the West Bank today. Gunfire and rocket blasts are being heard and felt in Jenin. The Israeli military has set up a blockade, shutting down all roads in and out of the town. It says Palestinians are using Jenin to plan a wave of suicide bombings. It's already been another violent day in the West Bank. Earlier, two Israeli police officers were killed during a shootout with Palestinians. Notice how CBC's report indicates past evening and day that Israeli military set up blockade around the Palestinian town of Jenin to prevent a wave of suicide bombers, all ironically reported until 8.32 a.m., September 11, 2001, just less than 15 minutes before the first plane strikes the North Tower? Well, 10 hours later, BBC didn't hold back hinting at the coincidence of Israeli IDF to being so prepared and having foreknowledge to deal with the circumstances in Jenin just before 9-11. But uh, first to the Middle East. Israeli tanks and bulldozers have entered the Palestinian-controlled city of Jenin in the northern West Bank. There is said to have been a heavy exchange of gunfire between Israeli troops and Palestinian gunmen. Israeli tanks had previously encircled Jenin in an operation which Israeli forces say was intended to prevent suicide bombers reaching Israel. Well, we can get more details now from Jerusalem and our correspondent Caroline Hawley. Caroline, is this just coincidental? to the events in the United States? Very hard to say. We have no word from the Israeli army about why they've decided to go into Janine now, some 24 hours after they encircled the town, blocking all the roads in and out of it, saying that they wanted to prevent further suicide bombers coming out of Janine after an Israeli Arab who was responsible for a suicide bombing attack in Israel on Sunday was accused by the Israelis of hiding in the town. Two days later, on September 13th, in continuing coverage... Let's go to the Middle East now. Um, the latest news we have is that Israeli troops are still surrounding the West Bank towns of Jericho and Jenin. It follows a night of fierce fighting in both areas. At least three Palestinians were killed, others were wounded. Elsewhere in the West Bank, an Israeli settler was shot dead in an ambush by Palestinian gunmen. The Palestinians accuse Israel of intensifying the action against them, while the world's attention is focused on the events in the U.S. Israeli troops on the move again, this time around the oasis town of Jericho, close to the Dead Sea. This was the first place to be given over to Palestinian control under a peace agreement reached eight years ago today. But that's long buried here now, as Israeli troops step up their military pressure on the Palestinians. 
They fought back. Exchanges of fire left some wounded and parts of the town burning. The Palestinians accuse Israel of exploiting the world's focus on America to broaden its fight against them. And Israel says it is toughening its approach. In the early hours of yesterday, Israeli troops came here into the very center of Janine, sparking strong resistance, scenes that were repeated overnight. But the casualties weren't all on the Palestinian side. This was the aftermath of another attack, an ambush by gunmen on an Israeli woman settler. Many shots were fired. The latest military escalation has brought new calls from Washington for restraint. In the wake of the devastating attacks against them, the Americans are urging both sides here to learn the appropriate lessons and return to the negotiating table soon. Well, many in the Arab world believe Israel is profiting from these, uh, those attacks in the US. And for more on that, I'm joined from Cairo by our correspondent, Frank Gardner. So, Frank, there's a sense again that Israel is, has the advantage. That's right. There is this widespread fear uh, throughout the whole Arab world that um, Israel will use the terrible tragedy on Tuesday to basically crush the Intifada, the Palestinian uprising, while the world is not really looking um, and hoping that the world will perhaps turn a blind eye. The Israelis already made it clear that they're going to take a tougher line against the Palestinians. Uh, the Israelis have been quite successful in managing to equate acts of Palestinian violence with what's happening, or what happened rather on Tuesday, uh, talking about all joining together. Uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, for example, who is not in power, but as the former Israeli prime minister, was able to kind of put this up on a, um, put the West and Israel up on a sort of plateau um, and saying that Islamic terrorism must be crushed. I think all Arabs are feeling that they are being unfairly stigmatized, that um, even if the perpetrators of Tuesday's attacks are found to be Arabs and Muslims, that doesn't mean to say that a whole billion Muslims in the entire Arab race should then be stigmatized. And it is also ironic, as BBC reporter Carolyn Holly pointed out in this September 13, 2001 report, that these ongoing exchanges between Palestine and Israel before and during September 11th seem to also be a symbolic date. That at this time, 9-13 was the eight-year anniversary of when the Oslo One Peace Accord was signed with Yitzhak Rabin and Yasser Arafat in 1993 at the White House. This is an issue that both Israeli and Arab hardliners were against, but... There is some good, limited work that's out there validating these IDF early warning signs, or preemptive or provoking by them, from some brave Israelis themselves. In 2006, Alternate Focus published an interview with Avicii Sharon and Noam Shayut, both IDF veteran whistleblowers who confessed to some of their inside knowledge on what happened on the morning of 9-11 in Janine, right before the attacks in New York. The first I'll give you, I'll quote my Ministry of, uh, of Foreign Affairs of Israel that said that the public opinion of the the public opinion in the US is the most powerful weapon that the IDF has or that the Israel has. And I can give you another extreme <coughs> example which uh, a soldier that uh Arichai interviewed, right? Um, one of us interviewed and He's in a unit that uh, engineer unit. They actually what they're doing is to blow up things, bridges, houses, um, and the idea didn't use them at the beginning of that. <coughs> the first time they used them was 9/11. Ten minutes after the the airplane hit the tower, the first airplane hit the tower. They were on the way to Jenin to blow up houses. Why that? I can tell you what he says. The soldier that was interviewed. The big brother wasn't looking, wasn't watching. So that's how much things are connected. Intriguing and important this story may sound, this is about all that we've been able to find or anything skeptical of these pre-9-11 actions going on in the Middle East. But that doesn't mean there isn't any additional information out there. But coming back to the impending timeline to zero hour, when considering overseas actions and suspicious activities outside U.S. borders in the early a.m. shouldn't be neglected when potentials of pretext phases are more likely to exist than what's known, as far as ones that do service. Early reporting can be warning signs, 
or are indicative of greater foreknowledge. But just before we get into that, to get a glimpse of what should be noted, as reported much earlier on 9-11, at 7.08 a.m., outside the Understanding 9-11, a television news archive week-long calendar collection. Good morning, everybody. In the news this morning, for the second time in two weeks, the U.S. has lost a spy plane over southern Iraq. Iraq said today that it claimed that it shot the plane down near the town of Basra. The U.S. says only that it has lost communications with the unmanned predator spy plane, but that it does not know why. In the field of independent media and research into the September 11th attacks, further truth-seeking has been seriously lacking, and such an early report has never been examined or brought to anyone's attention alternatively on 9-11 investigations, and to be put into consideration within truth movement claims, particularly when trying to account for how many Iraq war pretext opportunities and aspirations existed so quickly after September 11, especially when both Colin Powell and Condoleezza Rice stated in February and July 2001 that Iraq, under its leadership with Saddam, didn't pose any real threats against the U.S. or its neighbors. But while we're on the 9-11 morning timeline, what is also interesting to add to this is there were actually very early reports coming out already taking claims for the attacks just after Flight 77 struck the Pentagon, ABC News' Peter Jennings reported this. One of the enormous difficulties about terrorism, everybody knows, is that you, you, you almost immediately get a claim of responsibility, and you may get several, and people's suspicions get ramped up, given the obvious nature of people who they think are in, and, or know are involved in terrorism around the world. There has been a claim of responsibility, according to the Raiders News Agency, uh, made to Abu Dhabi television uh, in the Persian Gulf from uh, something called the Palestinian DFLP. Uh, the Palestinian DFLP is something called the Democratic Front for the Liberation of Palestine. Um, it has been for many, many years one of the uh, most militant of the Palestinian organizations. Um, has been involved in violence before, has been involved in, uh, in, in other actions before, and it is the first organization to claim responsibility for this, though we have to caution you in all the obvious ways that before the day is over, um, there may be any number of people who claim responsibility. Those not knowledgeable on the dynamics of secular or religious Palestinian political groups and organizations would easily find satisfaction in perceiving this as early bait to take credit for a pretext to frame and carry out a neocon fantasy of putting U.S. boots on the ground in Palestine. Even if this DFLP taking credit was a pretext attempt, it would actually help to satisfy a more direct and decisive neocon priority war pretext to substantiate certain decades-long relations and networks between Iraq and Palestine, particularly in the matters of displaced Palestinians. The Iraqi regime headed by Saddam has a history of allowing competing Palestinian splinter groups to take refuge in allowing to establish bases for each of the factions permitted, including those groups who are vowed enemies of the peace accords process and PLO, even though Saddam and Iraq have been open arms and welcoming towards Arafat and the mainstream Fatah faction. The DFLP is a Palestinian splinter group that although at the time mostly thought to be only based in Syria by the Assad regime, also has had bases and diplomatic relations with its opposers, Saddam and Iraq. Seven months after 9-11, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty reported on April 20. 2002, Iraqi Deputy Prime Minister Tariq Aziz offered beloved Palestine his moral support in a speech broadcast on April 14 on Republic of Iraq television. Aziz said, Zionism is not only a terrorist movement but also an imperialist one. Its usurper and occupier entity in Palestine is a criminal imperialist entity that is absolutely allied with U.S. imperialism and serves its aims in the Arab homeland. Aziz received on April 17 a delegation from the DFLP. Republic of Iraq Television reported their talks dealt with the latest developments of the Palestinian Intifada, its continuation and escalation of its struggle march to defeat the occupation forces and the Zionist imperialist aggression, according to Iraqi television. The DFLP split from the PFLP in 1969, and according to its charter, Palestinian goals can only be achieved through popular revolution of the working class. Just about a week before the U.S.'s first conflict in Iraq with Desert Storm, Washington Institute would even report Iraq deserted by Barry Rubin January 3rd, 1991. During the early part of the crisis, leaders of two major PLO member groups talked about aligning with Saddam's cause. George Habash of the PFLP and Naif Hakme of DFLP complained that Syria was siding with the imperialist pro-Israel America against an Arab brother, Iraq. They talked of closing down their Damascus headquarters and throwing in their lot with Baghdad. Months later, however, the PFLP and DFLP have stayed out, supporting Iraq in words, 
but remaining in Syria, less likely to become the target of U.S. warplanes. With so much that's been speculated about false pretext to blame Iraq, which would later come to buying time with the anthrax attacks and faulty links that intel provided by the Mossad, it would be hard to escape this idea or concept of this early DFLP report taking claim for the 9-11 attacks as a means to already stir conversation in a pretext against Iraq. But coming back to the morning of, reactions were coming in from around the world after 11 a.m. The head of the DFLP, Abu Layla, held a press conference announcing the Reuters report of the group taking claim for the September 11 attacks. The DFLP has no uh, relation to this uh, accident or this uh, incident. Uh, we have always been against uh, terroristic actions, against civilian uh, targets, and especially outside the occupied territories. Uh, but in spite of that, uh, we deny our responsibility, but we call upon the uh, American administration to review uh, their uh, attitude and their policy towards the Palestinian question, because this policy arouses the anger and the hatred uh, of our people and of all uh, Arab and Islamic peoples and uh, it's liable actually to, uh, uh, to uh, harm uh, the uh, interests of the United States in our region and therefore it has to be reviewed. And exactly or right around the same time, Yasser Arafat, the head of the PLO, would hold what would be his most distraught press conference. Reaction is now coming in from around the world. Let's first listen to PLO leader Yasser Arafat. First of all, I am offering my con condolences, the condolences of uh, the Palestinian people to the, uh, to the American President, no, President Bush, to his government, to the American people for this terrible act. We are completely shocked, completely shocked. Arafat would later go on encouraging Palestinians and others to donate blood, as would other Arab leaders, such as Muammar Gaddafi. As you may recall, the highly featured 1010 Winds AM and their reporting just three minutes after the first plane struck the North Tower by Mona Rivera about the solidarity rally in support of Israel scheduled for late September. Coming back to the morning time window with the greatly featured local New York channel and news anchor, if not the investigatory premise of this film series, WCBS2 with Marsha Kramer, where already 15 minutes after the South Tower collapsed, she also found it instinctively odd that the momentary attacks occurring are happening right before the New York Solidarity Rally in support of Israel. But you know, it's interesting here to reflect about the timing of this, what appears to be a terrorist attack. It comes just a few weeks before there was supposed to be a major world gathering of Jewish leaders on the 23rd of September that was supposed to be bringing in people from all around the country and around the world to voice support for Israel in its, its battles with the Palestinians. Um, in fact, all of the Israeli leaders were expected to attend and it was expected to try to send a message to the United Nations, which has its opening session at that time, that Israel needed support. Putting that in perspective, one could easily assume there would have been a deadline in place in order to coordinate and get clearance to pull off the 9-11 attacks so nearby in September if the attack date were truly a surprise, rather than in part with Mossad participating with other Israelis. But then again, so is the fact that Israeli Prime Minister Ariel Sharon had not confirmed whether he would appear to speak at the pro-Israeli rally. The option of him broadcasting his speech from Tel Aviv, Israel to the event in New York was an option still being considered rather than making a physical appearance in the U.S. The event was obviously postponed and relocated to Washington, D.C. But even after the 9-11 attacks were happening, suspiciously enough, Ariel Sharon back in Israel refused to take cover from becoming a possible target, as his security detail requested he do, due to fears of follow-up attacks there. But there will be more to get into about Sharon and Israeli presidents in the next coming part of this film series. But before we get there, there's something else rather important to point out in what Kramer reports over a half hour later. Well, actually, we had reports about 20 minutes ago that there was a plane that had been hijacked in Pittsburgh and was, was headed for either northern Virginia or Washington. That may have been the plane that crashed. If that's the case, then there's still four more planes in the air. Mm -hmm. But again, the report is that a total of eight American planes mm -hmm. have been hijacked. 
While not properly informed of Flight 93 having crashed in Shanksville, what details Kramer elaborates on are somewhat good speculation. But currently here on the timeline, Marsha assumes four other planes are still operational in mid-air after the four official hijacked planes had already crashed. It could be that perhaps authorities, just within hours of the attacks, were already scouring over manifests of departed Continental flights at airports, profiling any names that may appear Middle Eastern. Just remember this report with Kramer, as we'll address this just up ahead. The Air Force and military intelligence are scrambling to try to take these planes out of the air before they can do any damage. It's possible, obviously this is speculation, but it's possible that the plane that crashed out of Pittsburgh may have been targeted by a military uh, missile to try to take it down before it could crash into an American building. Ah, uh, could this be another clue as to who might have instigated the Flight 93 shootdown myth? rather than what's attributed to NBC and CNN, who generated the shootdown rumor the following day? From Kramer's press and civilian standpoint, it isn't exactly wild insinuation to have assumed a probability of a shootdown scenario, as Dan Rather's early precautionary warning to the 1993 Trade Center bombing, and the reasons being shared in relation to it, which we'll explain more just ahead. But despite reasonable skepticism and doubts regarding the means, profiles, and amounts of terrorists described in how United Flight 93 was hijacked, as well as possible similar cases with the other three official hijacked flights that's been hinted in other film productions from this channel, practically a majority, if not most, of 9-11 truthers and even ordinary people considered official defenders believe something otherwise happened. That there was no let's roll scenario where passengers successfully thwart the hijackers' mission as heroes, taking their own lives in an attempt to take back the plane and commandeer it, fighting off the terrorists in the cockpit, forcing the plane into an upside-down nosedive at nearly the speed of sound, obliterating it into a hole across an open field and wooded areas of Shanksville, Pennsylvania. Despite a minimal chain of evidence with witness accounts, technical data recovered from the crash site, and impact crater hole itself, corroborating and congruent in that Flight 93 did go down just as that, Instead, a large portion of the population still believes September 11th's oldest, if not original, urban myth that the United Airlines plane was shot down by NORAD over Shanksville. Despite variations to these Flight 93 theories or whatever discrepancies or skepticisms about the hijackers themselves, it's our position that we stand firm on in that the official, authentic Flight 93 was indeed hijacked and then crashed in Shanksville. But this is not the moment, nor do we have the time and the budget to feature a scientific analysis with detailed computer graphic models of Flight 93 crashing and also going over the results of the FBI and NTSB investigations. Viewers can check out the presentation of 9-11 TV org, Northern California 9-11 Truth Organizer, researcher Ken Jenkins, and his film on his channel, Flight 93 on 9-11, for examples of evidence and debris for anyone still in denial and disputes our position. But that doesn't erase that it's already established as a historical fact that Vice President Dick Cheney did issue NORAD to shoot down commercial airliners practically after the attacks, after 10 a.m., only for incoming unauthorized aircraft into Washington, D.C., you can hear air traffic control tape recordings of command center communicating with NORAD pilots getting the green light for shootdowns. The region commander has declared that we can shoot down aircraft that do not respond to our direction. Did you copy that? You read that from the vice president, right? Vice president has cleared. But there's also a twist to this as far as when the green light was given and who was capable of shootdowns. First and foremost, the vice president is not part of the military chain of command and therefore cannot order a shootdown under his sole authority, only the president and or secretary of defense. But more importantly, pilot Major Heather Penny in her F-16 became the closest to intercept Flight 93 and was seriously contemplating bumping as in partially colliding into Flight 93 to knock it off course amongst other tactics. She's become public about it since the 10-year anniversary. For, for the larger aircraft, again, it would simply be um, taking off the tail, which would be, you know, I would essentially be a kamikaze and ram my aircraft into the tail of the, of the aircraft. And, you know, I gave some thought to, you know, what I, what I have time to eject, but I would need to ensure that, I mean, you only got one chance. I mean, you don't want to eject and then have missed, right? I mean, you've got to be able to stick with it the whole way. When we came back and we continued to do the combat air patrol over D.C., and there were plenty of other aircraft airborne that we did actually have to turn away, um, what we... Final, what we employed was we, we would thump them. I mean, we would, we would fly in front of them and uh, uh, put out a flare or two. A flare is a, well, I mean, you know what a flare is. Uh, and so we'd, we'd 
pump out a flare out of the aircraft uh, and basically turn those other aircraft away. And we would also get on the, uh, the Victor frequency, um, it's called guard, and then try to communicate with the aircraft. Uh, that way it's a 121.5 is a frequency that all pilots know about and it's sort of a, it's called guard. It's universal if you get in trouble or you need help or you don't, you know, you're not on the same frequency. If you go over to the guard frequency, then you should be able to talk to anybody. So we would also try to get them up on guard. Major Penny's revelations are an important tip to remember for those countering urban myths about Flight 93. He details how a shootdown would have been an impossibility. The circumstance of her team of NORAD fighter jets in the middle of training drills closest to intercept Flight 93 were all unarmed, being that NORAD didn't train fully loaded and weren't armed in their immediate attempts to intercept hijacked airliners on 9-11. The troubles and anomalies about September 11 were never about whether Flight 77 could have been intercepted or if Flight 93 was shot down, because none of those urban myths were true. They were rumors based on misquotes and speculative rush to judgment, often made by bitter and deprived basket cases of sorts, that we'll explain in the next coming part of this film series. The bottom line is, in layman's terms, if the government admits it had the means and intention to shoot down United Flight 93, or any flight it could intercept afterward, why then would they, or NORAD, deny shooting down Flight 93, if capable and willing. But just to play devil's advocate, or even sympathize with the press's faulty reportings, considering Marsha Kramer working for a CBS affiliate out of New York, let us also reflect back on not-so-friendly mainstream media relations when it comes to FBI and law enforcement officials, such as the unresolved matters with the downing of TWA Flight 800 on July 17, 1996, from Long Island, where all 230 people on board died over the Atlantic Ocean 12 minutes after takeoff. The FBI and NYPD Joint Terrorism Task Force, JTTF, initiated a parallel criminal investigation. Sixty months later, the JTTF announced that no evidence of a criminal act had been found and closed its active investigation of the air disaster, ultimately leaving it to the NTSB to try to make a case of plain mechanical failure. As for the reason why the TWA flight blew up in mid-air as hundreds of witnesses saw it after already departing John F. Kennedy Airport, former CBS freelance journalist Christina Borgeson became personally involved in her own pursuit soon after hearing about all the witness accounts of the TWA plane being shot down. CBS assigned her to cover the crash after receiving a piece of physical evidence from inside the official crash investigation. The FBI demanded it back, inaccurately claiming it had been stolen. CBS returned the evidence and terminated Borgeson. Then Borgeson was hired to produce a segment about problems within the official crash investigation for a series pilot commissioned by ABC. Once the press got early word about Borgeson's segment in production, Set to examine whether or not a missile had downed Flight 800 rather than mechanical failure, ABC then canceled the entire series. Borgeson in 2013 released a documentary plainly titled TWA Flight 800. The film features six whistleblowers, all members of the original crash investigation, who reviewed the physical evidence they personally handled, interviewed dozens of eyewitnesses, and explained what really happened to the airplane. The film reveals how several U.S. government agencies, particularly the FBI, CIA, and lastly NTSB, colluded to undermine the official investigation. Interestingly, an older independent documentary from 2001, Silenced, Flight 800 and the Subversion of Justice, produced by Weekly World Net contributor Jack Cashill, referenced one victim's family member and spokeswoman, Marge Gross, who had already been alerted to the FBI's ongoing cover-up in its reverse-engineered chaos investigation of TWA 800 at the Calverton facility. At the National Press Club, she stated what she learned from WAPO investigative writer Serge Kavlaski about what the former head of the FBI FBI at the time, James Kalstrom, had actually really believed happened to TWA 800. Before everyone sat down at, at this corner, co corner conference table, uh, Serge Kovaleski said, uh, well, can't tell me it was anything other than a missile. And Jim Kalstrom said, you're right, but if you quote me, I'll deny it. Comparing the circumstances with Flight 93 in Shanksville to the federal conspiracy to cover up TWA 800 known within media profession circles, you can see logical reasons for faulty, alarmist reporting, as well as animosity towards the FBI or CIA before September 11th. The news networks who originally alluded or suspected Flight 93 was shot down didn't have to necessarily rely on early NORAD tips as reason to dare accuse the U.S. military of shooting down an American airliner full of passengers. But more importantly, what's compelling about Borgeson's Flight 800 documentary is the abundant value of witness accounts. Hundreds and hundreds of witnesses from Long Island and elsewhere in the vicinity saw the ill-fated flight blow up in mid-air as a result of one to three flaring objects rising out of several areas below and from the sea 
Perceptively, as missiles or rockets striking the plane, moments before the explosion and downing of the TWA airliner. This kind of data, witness evidence, has always and respectively been prioritized first and held to be the utmost value until physical evidence becomes accessible. At least that's how things were done before the world wide web of the internet took off after the millennium. This is why when it eventually came to September 11th and the skepticism with Flight 77 and the Pentagon attack, as well as Flight 93 in Shanksville, echo chambers of rumors and urban myths flourished rather than striving to collect and examine all the news archives first before publicizing one's junk science claims and bullshit theories. But what's true, yet again, despite Marsha Kramer stirring up faulty GW Bridge reporting and possibly also stirred up the myth of Flight 93 being shot down, her precautionary foresight and alarmist warnings is still vindicated. At 11.03 a.m., she still repeats warnings of eight hijacked airliners. Boris, Marcia. Well, you know, we're trying to keep track of those eight hijacked planes. We now have word that one of those planes may be in the area near Dulles Airport. Again, one of those hijacked planes may be in the air near Dulles Airport. We seem to have been able to account for a total of five of the planes. There's the one in the air right now near Dulles. There's one that we now have unconfirmed reports that crashed near Somerset County Airport in western Pennsylvania. And there are the three that have struck American targets, two at the World Trade Center and one in Washington at the Pentagon. That's five. The question is, where are the other three planes and where are they headed? Again, we do have a report that the, one of the eight planes that have been hijacked is on its way near somewhere near Dulles Airport, some target in the Texas area. Five planes counted out of eight near Dulles Airport, Texas area. Reports of suspect or unresponsive aircraft near Dulles Airport would be attributed to the D.C. area which coalesces with what accounts Pilot Major Heather Penny described about where she was ordered to patrol after unsuccessfully trying to intercept Flight 93 over Pennsylvania, that she had also been dispatched to fly back into D.C. and push back at other commercial aircraft that were not responsive to the Federal Aviation Administration's immediate national grounding. But regarding NORAD already being aware of the Texas area as a target or a reason for intercept raises several questions. Was Kramer receiving her information from sources likely scouring over flight manifests already looking for suspected names on operational flights, particularly with this claim of eight hijacked planes. This might give you a clue as to what was seen in part two as to why Marsha Kramer was so suggestive about it at the very beginning of city official press conferences at the police academy in the afternoon after her and CNN's Deborah Ferrick's inquiry on explosives in the Twin Towers to Mayor Rudolph Giuliani and Police Commissioner Bernard Carrick, all of which naturally arises in the timeline several hours later. We don't, we don't know of an additional explosion no, after that. Nothing. This would be the last time that Marsha Kramer would describe a scenario of eight hijacked planes on 9-11. But it wasn't the last time the alleged vehicle packed with explosives on the GW bridge came up in the media. But not coming from Kramer, who stirred up the rumor, this echo of the GWB wouldn't be from September 11 or the day after, instead on September 13, which would be considered a blackout date, not just for cover-ups, but in continued terrorist actions. Another one that's attracted a lot of attention is a report of a possible fifth plane. Be here's where that report comes from. On Tuesday morning, the morning of the terrorist attacks, at about the same time as the other planes were taking off, uh, there was a complaint at JFK in New York that three Middle Eastern men were in some kind of an argument with a ticket agent. That they got on the plane, that the airline called Port Authority Police, and by the time the Port Authority Police showed up, the men were nowhere to be seen. They'd left the scene. So that aroused a lot of suspicion that perhaps that was a potential fifth plane. However, a senior federal official tells NBC News that there's nothing credible to indicate that that was in fact a fifth plane. There's nothing to connect that to the uh, terrorist attacks. And in fact, this official says there are many well-meaning reports like that out there that officials have to check out, but that are turning out to be a wash. Yeah, that's right, Pete, because I think earlier yesterday we were heard, hearing some speculation. There were a couple of people arrested on the GW Bridge with, a, with explosives, either in a car or truck. And again, we've heard no information about that. So inevitably, stories uh, start to surface. Right. 
right, when something that, like this happens. Yes. Although uh, we're going to look more into that JFK flight a little bit more, Pete, because there are some very peculiar circumstances surrounding that. And I don't believe that flight ever took off. For those not familiar with this channel's lengthy, expensive documentaries, in order to better understand this feature premise and narrative, it's suggested that viewers also take the time to watch all of 9-11 Bojinka Maximum, untold hijacking attempts of September 11th and 13th. If the subtitle doesn't speak clearly enough, then perhaps the premiere date of this part in our film series might help clue you in. But before encouraging viewers to watch Bojinka Maximum, we must praise, thank, and recommend viewers to first watch TMZ 9-11 investigates the fifth plane as a cozy and contemporary warm-up about the subject of additional targeted planes. Because, unlike other showcases regarding the September 11th attacks as alternative conspiracies and cover-ups, TMZ finally brought mainstream attention to Flight 23 at JFK Airport, a mystery or addition to the enormous cover-up of unsold crimes of 9-11 that is already featured in our Bajinka Maximum film, if not the initial premise for it. TMZ was able to uncover more information than any independent body on the matter of United Airlines Flight 23, practically turning the incident into a whistleblowing issue of sorts. Sadly, since Flight 23 co-pilot Carol Tim has passed away in recent years, as the only witness and crew member who had gone public on the matter, TMZ was able to take off where she left off by interviewing the actual lead pilot and several flight crew members doing reenactments of how they all encountered a number of suspicious foreign Middle Eastern looking passengers who reacted erratically once they learned the flight was cancelled due to the ongoing 9-11 attacks. One passenger appeared to be a man disguised as a woman in full shawl. Their reactions to deplaning Flight 23 once it returned to the gate with the request of the immediate evacuation of the airport drew even more concern as ground workers noticed two uniformed people roaming the cabin 20 minutes after after the door was locked. When authorities boarded the plane to investigate, the hatch that led to the belly of the plane into the passenger cabin was mysteriously open, this becoming not only a whole new door, pun intended, but a revelation of tangible possibilities as answers regarding the vast anomalies about the four official hijackings that do exist. But TMZ's The Fifth Plane didn't go as far as Bojinka Maximum does, that being when it comes to what likely happened to the Flight 23 suspects who fled JFK Airport by itself. TMZ failed to address what occurs back at JFK and and other airports, especially New York area, once reopening after the national ground stop was lifted on September 13, that there were more destined to be targeted for additional hijack missions set to go off there in the afternoon as attempts after 9-11, all likely either pre-planned for afterward or merely reactivated hijackings either aborted or thwarted from the September 11 no-fly ban and other obstacles that day. This we will briefly explain more up ahead. So without making things more confusing or hinting and describing other fifth flights, this circumstance that Marsha Kramer speaks of may be faulty reporting based on secondhand communication relayed as far as some possible insight into NORAD movements and targets. But to be fair, this again is not alarmist or misreporting of Kramer. It could also be a reason why she would have quickly and naively suggested the possibility Ability, NORAD was prepared enough and did shoot down Flight 93. In an extension as to why NORAD wasn't able to actually intercept that flight or even dispel the stand down theory based on the limited scope of the 9 11 Commission reports for planes, never mind the zeitgeist buzzwords of George W. Bush, Dick Cheney, or Condoleezza Rice stating that their administration as well as prior administrations were not aware of such an attack to be carrying out with planes striking buildings. This is beyond nonsense on so many levels that it does not require cryptic or early warning signs targeting the Twin Towers to make the point. If truth be told, if such a situation were to occur, more than four hijacked planes, NORAD still were only trained to deal with multiple hijacking scenarios in the classic plan coming overseas from Asia to North America. To put it in a better way, NORAD or the National Security State were only thinking in terms of a coordinated hijacking attempt plan to strike the U.S. would occur from planes flying from overseas into the continental United States. Why? As we've explained repeatedly in previous and most recent extended films about the original targeting of the Twin Towers, in The Hidden Path to 9-11, World Trade Center Bombing of 1993, False Flag Terrorism Cover-Ups and Missing Links, the threat assessment and capability to hijack a fleet of airliners into the continent from overseas to strike U.S. targets is what's originally found on the 1993 World Trade Center bomber Ramsey Yusuf's laptop, a laptop retrieved after his kitchen caught fire from making bombs in his Philippines apartment as a 1993 bombing fugitive for nearly two years. Yusuf and others fled, but he had sent his longtime friend and trained pilot, Abdul Hakim Murad, to sneak back in the apartment while authorities started to investigate the situation after the fire was extinguished. Murad was then caught by Philippine authorities. The plan discovered on Yusuf's laptop was codenamed Bojinka, Operation Bojinka, O Plan Bojinka, 
or what we prefer to call the Bojinka plot. A plan that seemed to have been broken into three phases, with part of it incorporating an assassination of the Pope while visiting the Philippines. The later phase being that 12 planes would be hijacked and crashed rather than just bombed as initially planned. Seven of the flights would be departures from Asia, while the other five flights would be departures from Honolulu, LAX, San Francisco, Chicago O'Hare, and JFK in New York. The targets would be the World Trade Center, Pentagon, U.S. Capitol, the White House, CIA headquarters in Virginia, Sears Tower, the U.S. Bank Tower in L.A., the Transamerica Pyramid in San Francisco, Las Vegas, as well as other targets. Nuclear power facilities are often mentioned. Early versions of Bojinka indicated to be a simultaneous attack to the effect of a dozen Pan Am 103 bombings, or as a combination of both still with bombs and being airliner kamikazes in second phases with U.S. targets and U.S. airports underlined, including the ones that were used and targeted on 9-11 and previous to September 11th with the 2000 Millennium plot. There are more than several cases at the three airports where the four official hijacked airliners departed, as well as many of the other major airports throughout the East and West Coast, all with the most major U.S. airlines being targeted. We don't have time to go through them all, but we'll bring up one circumstance that we've raised before. Putting that into consideration on September 11, especially two days later when airports reopened on 9-13, despite that none of the NORAD fighters were available or armed when called to intercept airliners during their training exercises, in the end, whoever was truly organizing attacks on America had follow-up plans to demonstrate no concern or care for NORAD's effectiveness and air presence as defense for possible interceptions, physically thwarting any of their missions, meaning that NORAD fighters would have potentially been outnumbered by targets to intercept regardless of any one pilot or jet capability. It didn't matter. NORAD couldn't possibly do anything else but create more damage, despite that the manpower and conspirators in the 9-11 operation were very well equipped and prepared to target more than just a dozen airliners, in addition to what is also covered in 9-11 Bojinka Maximum, and is never really pointed out among countless critics and accusations made of Bush administration officials and staff over the years in how they immediately handled September 11th in the aftermath besides frequent accusations of neglect, Charges of incompetence were never strongly used and completely oblivious when it comes to the National Transportation Safety Board, for which the Federal Aviation Administration, FAA, also falls under. Revealed in 9-11 Bojinka Maximum is incompetence on the part of Transportation Secretary Norman Mineta by way of his reaction and consequences that he explained expressively during the immediate press conferences on the morning of 9-13 as most airports officially reopened without any real new security measures put in place, but only routine revamping that had been done in the past during heightened threats. Manetta stated that his only reaction to placing the NTSB no-fly ban, that being the grounding of all commercial aviation within and coming into the continental U.S., was after the third plane, American Airlines Flight 77, came into D.C. and struck the Pentagon. Let me take the... Secretary? Yes, as you receive reports on what happened Tuesday, is there anything that you've seen that you wish the people of this department had done differently? Oh, you know, um, I suppose um, those kinds of um, what ifs and could haves and should haves, uh, I really don't want to get into that. We've got 47,000 employees in the, in the FAA who on, on Tuesday, uh, in terms of especially the air traffic control element of it, just perform superbly. You know, when that first plane went down at 8.50, and then 17 minutes later the second one went, and then 23 minutes later the third one we lost. One is an accident, two is a trend, three is a program. And when that third airplane went down is when I said to the FAA, shut it down. Bring every airplane in the air to the ground. And at that point we had over 2,100 airplanes in the air. And with, in less than two hours, we brought every one of those airplanes, the air traffic control system, air traffic controllers, brought those airplanes down safely in some airport. And so to me, the, 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 are there things that could have been done differently? Sure, I suppose. Um, 
there are things I wish I had done differently on Tuesday, maybe, or Monday, or last month. Uh, those I'd rather not get into. This is allegedly just moments after what's frequently cited in 9-11 commission hearings, stating his account in the Presidential Emergency Operations Center, PIOC bunker, with Vice President Dick Cheney, and that he witnessed him give stand-down orders, alleging that NORAD was tracking Flight 77 and were in position to shoot it down. There was a young man who would come in and say to the Vice President, the, the plane is 50 miles out, the plane is 30 miles out, and when it got down to the plane is 10 miles out, the young man also said to the vice president, do the orders still stand? And uh, the vice president turned and whipped his neck around and said, of course the orders still stand. Have you heard anything to the contrary? Therefore preventing it from striking the Pentagon. But this has also been a problem noted even by 9-11 debunkers. Even those who disagree with the conspiracists acknowledge that Secretary Mineta's testimony raises questions. There are sort of inconsistencies that uh, don't help anybody. Which aircraft does that apply to? Was that talking uh, about the plane that crashed into the Pentagon? As Mineta said during testimony, was that actually talking about Flight 93 as it was what it appears in the 9-11 Commission report? I've not heard any final word and I would love to. Because as long as that stuff does hang around then people just keep coming up with new and crazier theories to explain what happened. Secretary Mineta would not appear on camera for this report. He stands by his original testimony and says he's unaware his comments have been incorporated into a 9-11 conspiracy theory. On the morning of September 11, 2001, Mineta was having breakfast in his conference room with Deputy Prime Minister of Belgium, Isabel Durand, and Jane Garvey, the head of the FFA. He had momentarily stepped away and went into his office and watched the news on television as the North Tower was on fire, smoking, and then saw the second plane strike the South Tower live. He went back into the conference room and excused himself, ordering Garvey to head to the FAA Operations Center to deal with New York after getting a phone call from the White House requesting he go there. Despite him noticing everybody else evacuating upon arrival, he was debriefed by Richard Clark there and then ordered to go into the Peoc bunker. Mineta said he arrived around 9.30 a.m. and was already busy situating himself there, which would have been several minutes, and it basically would have been an impossibility for NORAD to have been given a stand-down order on Flight 77 even if they were armed. Why? Because Flight 77 would have struck the Pentagon seven minutes later. This is what Mineta said in a 10-minute short interview from 2016. Military assistant came in and said to the vice president, there's a plane coming towards DC. So I said to Money, I said, Money, what do you have on radar of a plane coming towards DC? He said, Well, we're tracking a, a plane coming towards DC, but the transponder is turned off. In my office, on my credenza behind my desk, I had a monitor with the outline of the 48 states of Alaska and, and Hawaii. If I took my mouse and put it on a dot, then a flag would come up and it'd say, United Airlines, flight 123. Then it would show me uh, speed of the plane, compass direction, tell me all about the airplane. Well, that information is being transmitted by what's called a transponder on the airplane. But in this case, the transponder had been turned off so all they were doing was following the little dot on the radar set with the 11 second sweep of the, of the radar. Well, it's hard to look at a radar and then try to relate it to a point on the ground. So I'd say, well, where is it? And so he'd say, well, probably in the middle of Pennsylvania somewhere. Well, where is it now? Well, somewhere maybe north of Baltimore. Well, where is it now? Um, Pentagon City and uh, National Airport. Where is it now? Money. Uh, Mr. Secretary, we just lost the bogey. We just lost the target. See what I mean? His recollection is not tracking an American Airlines plane over the Virginias, Kentucky, and Ohio, but tracking a United Airlines plane over Pennsylvania, which would obviously be Flight 93 that crashed in Shanksville. A plane being tracked in Baltimore is likely what stirred up the myth that a plane crashed at Camp David. One of the reasons why the presidential retreat was thought to be a target is because it was the location of the signing of the Camp David Accords, the bilateral agreement between Egyptian President Anwar Sadat and Israeli Prime Minister Menachem Begin, which incidentally occurred on September 7th. 
17, 1978. But everything else Mineta is describing could be a combination of other flights in the air still trying to ground after Flight 77 had already crashed into the Pentagon. But this short film did not bring due diligence or clarity to the precise claim of placing the no-fly ban, even after clearly demonstrating that Mineta's dialogue would have been all about Flight 93, well after Flight 77 already crashed, for which apparently he was not aware of for a great period of time. When you see one of something, it's an accident. When you see two of the same thing, it's a trend. But when you see three of the same thing in a relative, relatively short period of time, it's a plan. Mineta's testimony as far as trying to figure or ferret out anything nefarious within the administration is useless, just as he was serving as Secretary of Transportation. Even if all NORAD fighters were armed and specifically knew the hijackers were kamikaze missions, airliners in the middle of crowded air traffic that's attempting to carefully ground their flights due to the no-fly ban would make it more complicated than just attempting to intercept a lone civilian plane. Unfortunately, even when it comes to some of the debunkers, they often get it right in regards to the hijackings and destruction of the planes. On that day, you saw a lot of well-meaning, confused people struggling to make sense of a, of a terrible situation. They didn't even know where the planes were. And their whole protocol wasn't to put their jets as close to the cities as possible. It was a peacetime mindset. And that's what we saw. You didn't need a stand-down order. You didn't need Dick Cheney calling the shots. And that morning, there were actually only 14 planes on alert in the entire lower 48 states. Uh, eventually, four of them got off the ground and were scrambled. 14 to 16 jets versus 12 planes is not exactly an easy mission where all successful intercepts or shootdowns are expected, if given those rare and set of unusual circumstances and scenarios. The bottom line here is that no matter how long you've been beating the dead horse, NORAD's lack of response is not evidence of administration complicity, benign neglect, or implication of air defense role no matter how much of a demonic son of a bitch war criminal you believe Dick Cheney is, or if that you've romanticized Manetta as a whistleblower for his testimony. In reality, his check-in time into the Piak bunker contradicts the official narrative in the 9-11 Commission report as to when he was present and which of the two flights he claimed Cheney was making orders attributed to, all shaped into pointless distractions and suggestions for stand-down orders of unarmed fighter jets. The fact is that our, our air defenses, uh, the whole NORAD system, was not at all geared towards protecting us from domestic aircraft. Quite the contrary. It was all set up to detect aircraft coming in from overseas. Initially Soviet bombers, more recently drug smugglers and stuff like that. As for the role of Vice President Cheney, the 9-11 Commission reported that he was notified about United Flight 93 at 10.02 a.m., one minute before the airplane struck the ground. Eight minutes later, military jets in the sky were awaiting orders to shoot. The commission report says Vice President Cheney called President Bush at 10.18 a.m. They had a two-minute conversation, after which the Vice President obtained the authorization to shoot down a commercial aircraft if necessary. NORAD was informed at 10.31 a.m. By then, it was too late. Lack of interception is a weak and misinformed claim primarily preserved for competing no-planers as a last straw to save one's credibility from falling victim to being misled by such ilk or fringes, mainly those fanatically outlandish placeholder theories regarding Flight 77 and the Pentagon attack, while continuing blissfully ignorant regarding issues and hard evidence of criminal cover-ups for the hijacking operatives at the airports. And to make the example that TMZ also failed to take notice of is proper protocols being executed and followed, which saved United Airlines Flight 23 at JFK Airport from becoming a doomed flight targeted for September 11. Rather significantly sampled as the intro to 9-11 Bojinka Maximum, taken from the 2005 History Channel documentary Grounded on 9-11, is that United Airlines Director of Flight Dispatch Joe Vickers immediately instituted that all their flights be grounded at 9.04 a.m., just a minute after Flight 175 crashed into the South Tower, ordering flight crews to lock the cockpit doors, alerting them to the threat of hijackers. Basically, if United Airlines hadn't reacted instantly and instead waited for the orders by the FAA and the NTA be under Mineta's supervision, who only placed the order to ground all commercial aviation once the third hijacked plane came in his direction in DC and struck the Pentagon, Flight 23 might have succeeded if cleared to depart JFK Airport, thus succeeded as the fifth plane of 9-11, as well as possibly any other United flights. But returning to the last point of the timeline with NBC about Flight 23 on September 13, but back to WCBS 2. 
or at least UPN 33 affiliate, as seen on 9-11 Bojinka Maximum in the evening outside New York area airports JFK and LaGuardia, had recently been shut down once more and evacuated, canceling all flights again after reports in the afternoon about multiple suspect activities that seemed to be strongly related to hijacking attempts and even a bomb threat occurring earlier in the day. Jennifer McLogan reported several times on 9-13 throughout the evening at JFK and in one instance claimed that she and her crew were threatened with arrests from reporting outside the location of where suspects were being held by the Port Authority. But simultaneously, WCBS2 newscaster Pablo Guzman could be seen outside of LaGuardia elaborating on preparations for Air Force One and President Bush's visit to Ground Zero the following day, but also, and more importantly, bringing clarity about the two unidentified Middle Eastern suspects arrested from there in the afternoon who were repeatedly displayed by ABC, CNN, Fox, as well as local subsidiary stations and foreign news networks throughout the evening and morning of 9-13 and 9-14, September 14th. As this channel has previously mentioned in this film series, as well as other documentaries about the need to acquire and procure full television coverage of news broadcasts pertaining to the September 11th attacks, especially given the limitations of Archive.org's Understanding 9-11, a television news archive, but WCBS2 broadcast specifically on the day of September 11th, which has been the premier news network focus of this film series, are not available on the Archive.org page and have only been made available through YouTube and social media. Despite that, there will be more to add about Marsha Kramer's Bojinka hindsight in future parts of this film series. However, some days of the week on the archive.org page, such as September 13th, 14th, and 15th are available, whereas any of the other days of the week are not. But in the midst of the deeply seated Islamophobic Trump supporters that took Dan Rather's statement on David Letterman as fact or evidence to back Trump's 2015 claim of celebratory Muslims in Jersey, an obscure and crappy recording of WCBS2 coverage days after the 9-11 attacks, reporting on the investigation in the surrounding areas, appeared in this VHS tape digitized by way of a moving and unstable handheld camera recording of it playing on a television monitor of September 16th with Pablo Guzman in the studio. Should Pablo Guzman is here now the latest on the investigation. We have arrests and arrest warrants. Pablo? Todd, Dana, step by step it happens. Now most of you know that yesterday the FBI raided an apartment in Jersey City where two men lived who were pulled off a train in Texas and are now back in New York being held in connection with Tuesday's attacks. Ayub Ali Khan, 51, and Mohammed Jawi Azma, 47, taken off the train they had boarded after their flight out of Newark, like every other flight in America, was ordered down after the attacks in New York, Washington, and Pennsylvania. For those of you who haven't watched 9-11 Bojinka Maximum, Osmoth and Khan weren't just on any regular flight that got grounded by the no-fly ban. They were on American Airlines Flight 1729, out of Newark Airport that had just departed 8 minutes after Flight 93 did at 8.50 a.m. That later crashes in Shanksville. They took a train from St. Louis, Missouri where their flight had been grounded and were later spotted in Texas acting nervous and having a verbal confrontation with each other. They were found with numerous suspicious items and details identical or similar to the alleged 9-11 hijackers. According to reports at the time, one of them had plastic box cutter knives and claimed it was used for their previous job at a newsstand. The original details conveyed from Flight 77 passenger Barbara Olson's call to her husband, Solicitor General Ted Olson, described the hijacker having a plastic-like knife weapon. This seemed to coincide with the case of Osmoth and Khan for authorities to conclude or mend the situations of public inquiries of travel safety concerns, sparking the narrative of the box cutters being the official weapons in all four cases of hijacked flights, regardless of what details to the contrary were witnessed and relayed from the crew and passenger air phones. Osmoth and Khan lied to authorities on numerous accounts of fraud, such as their ages, claiming at first to be 47 and 51 years old, when they don't look nearly that old. To get a good idea on how much of these off-the-book kinds of cell operations generate and are able to function, it's done so in the already secret underworld of the black market and organized crime. Osmoth and Khan had a credit card scam running unpaid balances totaling nearly half a million dollars. They were originally detained as material witnesses and were charged with fraud and INS violations and eventually deported a year later. Both Osmoth and Khan had fake Indian passports, and according to their landlord, Osman Rabu, they had been living in 6 Tonell Avenue, Jersey City, New Jersey, apartment 202, for five to six years. More of this story could be turned into a minifilm, and there's a little bit more to explain about them just ahead. But, coming back to the Guzman report from September 16th, the intent of releasing this rare archive, presuming that the motives are just meant to galvanize Islamophobia and or resurrect hateful hysteria in the aftermath of September 11, was not the actual intent, even though that sort of sentiment might be harbored within those who published it. 
However, under normal circumstances, anyone holding such hostility or vengeance as a consequence of 9-11 at least knows the score or has a set one in their head, that being adherence to the official narrative of the attacks carried out as Al-Qaeda, 19 hijackers, under the orders of Osama bin Laden, or Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. They'll simply advocate and defend the 9-11 Commission report with no question and as historical fact. Never mind 9-11 truth and alt media or Jersey celebrations. If such persuasion aforementioned is thought of as the typical sentiment of Trump supporters, you have to question their neglect or severe lack of curiosity. Even after a decade and a half later, with so much forgotten and unknown about 9-11, there was no outrage from the future MAGAs coming across Osmoth and Khan on a WCBS2 archive who appears as a result of the campaign and... Middle Eastern or Muslim-looking suspects, potential terrorist hijackers that law enforcement already had in custody, who've now somehow vanished from the official story, clearly, these two would increase the hijackers' roster beyond 20 terrorists, surpassing Zacharias Massawi, who was the only thought to be additional hijacker in the September 11th conspiracy that's officially charged. Also, Osmoth and Khan's arrests are included with other unknown Middle Eastern suspects mentioned in Serge Kavlasky's Northern New Jersey Draws Prober's Eyes WAPO article from September 17th. The same article Trump read off at his Daytona Beach rally August 3rd, 2006, for which he would later be falsely branded for making fun of disabled people. But separate from that distraction, despite clueless future MAGAs, where's the curiosity or outrage about this Osmoth and Khan discovery by 9-11 truth seekers or even Alex Jones and Infowars? Regarding these revelations from the Don himself, not even as a controversial opportunity brought up by the 9-11 families united, still trying to sue Saudi Arabia and seek further accountability. Understand that this is not about splitting hairs when September 11 is thick and the superficially motivated only see it as thin. If 9-11 truth seekers are actually seriously committed to some sort of justice, accountability, or sign of September 11th turnaround, or dare I say, dream that there could ever be a candidate who would dare come in and deliver that demand, then that person or opportunities which have now come to pass was through Donald J. Trump. But the truth movement, his Trump supporters, or the people, could not deliver. Quantity superseded quality, and that has disastrous effects on supporters of politicians or a cult of personality as alternative media. Although there seem to be divisions of opinions here on what Trump actually meant or was dog whistling to as far as his Jersey celebratory statements as well as those that claim that Dan Rather's statements on the Letterman show are actually referring to Muslims or Arabs. Rather celebratory claims added with roof set up for documentation details is the dancing Israelis likely from both being at Doric Towers and on the roof of Urban Moving Systems company van and warehouse and was information likely disclosed to him from other sources doing follow-ups from vehicles and suspects due to criticism of echoing George Washington Bridge misreporting. But coming back to that lousy camcorder recording of Guzman's WCBS2 report on September 16th in the studio, as evidence to vindicate the Don's claim of Muslims in Jersey celebrating while running for Republican nominee. However, what no one outside the terrorist task force knows is that just a couple of blocks away from that Jersey City apartment the FBI raided yesterday and where they had evidence removed, is another apartment building, one that an investigator told me, quote, is swarming with suspects. Suspects who I'm told were cheering on the roof when they saw the plane slam into the trade center. Now, police were called to the building by other neighbors and found eight men celebrating, six of them tenants in the building. The FBI and other terrorist task force agencies then arrived, and the older investigators on the task force recalled that they had been to this building before, eight years ago, when the first World Trade Center attack led them to Sheikh Omar Abdul Rahman, whose Jersey City mosque lies between the two buildings getting attention today. And the older investigators remembered that suspects who eventually got convicted for the first Trade Center case, followers of Sheikh Rahman, lived in the building where these same eight men were celebrating the destruction that they saw from the roof. Calling this a hot address, the task force investigators ordered everyone detained. And they saw something else, a model of the Trade Center on the roof, along with sets of binoculars, the kind of model used by an architect or an engineer for a presentation, an investigator told me. What's going on here? Eight Middle Eastern suspects with suspicious and prior foreknowledge witness on the roof of the apartment building and engineer model reference of the Twin Towers? Do you understand now, as we had covered in part two regarding Bernard Carrick, why he didn't come near or completely avoided mentioning Jersey City as a place for celebratory incidents despite Trump specifically stating it? There were celebrations uh, in Brooklyn, uh, around Atlantic Avenue, uh, in Queens, um, Patterson, New Jersey, 
Jersey, uh, I think Jersey City as well. As mentioned in the full OAN report, Carrick is a born and raised Jersey resident. He wasn't going anywhere near Weehawken, New Jersey, or even near the GWB in suggesting an incident occurred there. The areas Carrick confirmed were primarily in New York and not New Jersey as Trump specifically mentioned. I watched when the World Trade Center came tumbling down. And I watched in Jersey City, New Jersey. But never mind the impossibility or Trump's inaccuracy of having been able to see such an event happen in Jersey while the attacks were going on, or the exaggeration of thousands of people, Muslims, as what's easily alluded to. But for being chief of police, having greater intimate knowledge on investigation, nothing about Carrick's recollection in the OAN interview actually supported Trump's claims. Patterson, New Jersey is 21 miles southwest in New Jersey, away from Manhattan, nowhere near the Hudson, or anything close in perspective to view the attacks as they happen, coinciding with Trump's details, especially celebrating as the buildings were coming down, which ultimately implies both prior knowledge, including acknowledgement of detonations of the World Trade Center, just by Trump mixing up the celebratory story, meaning that it also hints that he recognizes the suspect's detonation foreknowledge too. But for Carrick, he only thinks there were celebrations in Jersey City. Uh, I think Jersey City as well. Regardless if it was Arabs or Muslims on the surface in the first and second attacks on the Twin Towers, Jersey City being the neighborhood of the 1993 World Trade Center bombing conspirators, an attack on the surface used explosives and intent to bring down both buildings. Certainly, there's no way Carrick would want to entertain that specific incident in that neighborhood again to resurrect it as a hot area on 9-11, then lending provocation for explosive and detonation foreknowledge on the World Trade Center attacks, which as we've demonstrated, Carrick has played an intimate role instantly covering up publicly regardless if the bulk of the truth movement's intent is to limit the scope to domestic suspects operating detonations as the boogeymen that don't exist. Authorities have tried their best to make it seem that there were no additional unaccounted for conspirators or anything remotely to do with foreknowledge, which by itself will be covering in upcoming parts. The bottom line here is that Carrick's total confidence is dismissive in his sureness of Jersey City. Carrick intentionally pretends to be unconfident about the most damning locations because of these urban myths between Jersey City, Oaxacan, and all the way into the Meadowlands. When considering also the history of the neighborhood, that being the Journal Square, with the 1993 World Trade Center, Carrick is most certainly protecting not only a 9-11 narrative, but a 9-11 legacy. But that didn't prevent others to speak out. As a consequence of both Trump's celebratory remarks and the 2015 release of the September 16, 2001 WCBS2 handheld recorded Pablo Guzman report, this story has been analyzed in detail in the New Jersey real-time news on December 22, 2015. Exclusive, some Jersey City Muslims did celebrate 9-11, cop and residents say. Unlike some researchers who try to pass themselves off as exclusive experts on 9-11 truth or skepticism, here is actual follow-up investigative journalism done on this account for any real truth seekers trying to figure out if there's credibility to these Trump Jersey rumors. Here in this Jersey article, they also point out that New Jersey Muslim leaders voiced their concerns publicly over Trump's statements. Jersey City Mayor Stephen Fulop, seen here on December 3rd press conference, in which religious and political leaders denounced Donald Trump, says there is no record of Muslim celebrations in Jersey City on 9-11. Also stating, there are no records of this, and over time, what has happened is that it has become urban legend in many cities where people say they heard or saw something, Fulop said. But the article does further indicate, or partially vindicate Trump's claim, that there was at least celebrations of Arab or Muslims in Jersey City, just not within the thousands, as we've clearly corrected that mistake to the best of our ability. But some of the details of the reports of the rooftop incidents included loud gatherings going on on the streets and sidewalks that were even abruptly broken up by distraught neighbors and law enforcement, which still testified to Mark Mueller's article in the New Jersey Advanced Media for NJ.com. It also states, a retired police captain, Peter Gallagher, said he cleared a rooftop celebration of 20 to 30 people at 6 Tonell Avenue a four-story apartment building with an unobstructed view of Lower Manhattan in the hours after the second tower fell. Further down, it also says, The building was cited in a September 16, 2001 WCBS television news clip in which reporter Pablo Guzman, citing unnamed sources, said federal officials had detained eight men seen cheering on the roof. That account could not be independently verified. It basically shows several photos, including aerial views and rooftop images, of the Sevilla 2801 John F. Kennedy Boulevard, including the 6 Tonell Avenue apartment, the building shown in the Guzman Report, as well as throughout the vicinity of the Journal Square in Jersey City. 
the same neighborhood of where the Masjid al Salam Mosque is at, the same place where most 1993 World Trade Center bombers regularly attended. But with the Sevilla apartment on JFK Boulevard, as indicated in the Guzman report, this is a particularly disturbing revelation. No authors or researchers of alternative September 11th conspiracy theories have ever mentioned or spoken about such an incident. It's virtually non-existent in that genre. This is disturbing given all the overfocus of 9-11 truth conspiracy theories about the destruction of the Twin Towers. Why would these Middle Eastern suspects up on top of the roof of the Sevilla apartment have a 3D architectural model of the Twin Towers? Is this indicative of something more nefarious going on other than having foreknowledge of the attacks and the destruction of the World Trade Center? Better yet, where were architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth to address this? Have they been too busy selling non-existent nanothermite? Or chasing after empty buildings? Or Alex Jones's demons? It certainly seems so, since that on the cusp of the 20-year anniversary of September 11th, Richard Gage, the founding CEO of the organization, would be fired from the famed group he founded throughout the four years of Trump. Despite having received a letter from the campaign, as mentioned in Part 2, Gage became obsessed with non-related 9-11 topics such as witch hunting after Bill Gates and being a loud anti-vaccine advocate. But being that there are so many unanswered questions and speculations of how elaborate the attacks actually were, was the building or other housing in the neighborhood being used in precision and coordination with the attacks? This is not some crazy assertion, given the intent of the first attack in 1993 with the confirmed World Trade Center bombing, which this channel has invested a great deal of studying with producing its past documentaries around the subject, particularly in the most recent film, The Hidden Path to 9-11, World Trade Center Bombings of 1993, False Flag Terrorism Cover-Ups and Missing Links in 2022, where we have demonstrated plenty of good reasons looking at the strategies and abilities of suspects involved in both World Trade Center and New York landmark plots, as well as early signs of gold precisions to bring down the Twin Towers leading up to 9-11, including revelations of profit motives afterward. In respect of to urban moving systems, Mossad accusations with explosive detections, it's not some crazy assertion to add, given the evidence and knowledge in that Arab terrorist or Islamic fundamentalist within or without the Al-Qaeda network could have had access and capability as explosives operatives, pre-placing and or detonation function to serve also as booby traps inside the Twin Towers in concert with the terrorist attacks with the hijacking combat. Causes. Take for instance one of the earliest examples this channel has had with its most popular and oldest film series, An Inconvenient 9-11 Truth Part 1. About the case of the five Middle Eastern suspects linked to Danko Mechanical and Magic Heating and Air having prior and unauthorized access to the Twin Towers just days before September 11th, and were arrested months later in Tennessee on a sting for fraudulent IDs which was subsequent to the FBI's 9-11 dragnet. Despite the contradictions of the time window and leaseholders and property management, that case in Tennessee should make 9-11 truth seekers become more considerate about the foreign cohesion possibilities if the controlled demolition argument is your sacred cow. But also consider that the final destruction of the World Trade Center only accounts for a fraction of 9-11 victim fatalities. Then what's spectacularly estimated? Just as the way that the Bergen police officers reacted to arresting the dancing Israelis in the Meadowlands and the subsequent explosive detection coming in as well as Newark's FBI suspicions of their involvement, it would also make sense that like Marsha Kramer's reporting from Manhattan and later misreporting the dancing Israelis arrest with the white van searches as explosives on the GW bridge, even law enforcement in the immediate aftermath also felt that there were explosives in the Twin Towers. Despite whatever was being said by New York City officials at the police academy or architectural and scientific experts mainstream media were in a rush to PowerPoint to, Others in law enforcement didn't feel quite safe or assured by city or government officials regarding what happened to the Twin Towers, and if there were any follow-up attacks to come. Such feelings were picked up by Connecticut TV network WTNH News 8, who are featured in part one of this film series in their misreporting on the GW Bridge. New York City police stopped us on the street tonight and wanted to convey the following. They would like anybody in Connecticut who was in Lower Manhattan today who shot their own video or still pictures to call them. They would like to see what you have on your own videotape or your own pictures because they are looking for faces in the crowd. It may be critical to solving this case. Logically being within the perimeter of the World Trade Center complex or just on street level, specifically anything capturing faces that could be suspects, how would people on the ground have anything to do with the hijackings if we're being told that this ultimate orgy of spectacular terror is a lesser sophisticated operation? But in any case, that was a striking revelation, and so was what author Peter Lance 
extensively documented in his first self-authored investigative trilogy of 9-11 books, 1,000 Years of Revenge, International Terrorism, and the FBI, The Untold Story, Lance spoke of a circumstance he was intimately involved in after 9-11 on investigating the story of New York City Fire Marshal Ronald Buka of Rescue One, who also died in the South Tower on 9-11, but about his discovery before all of that with a fellow co-worker for the New York Fire Department, an Egyptian accountant named Ahmed Rafai. Lance was able to collect Buka's information about Rafai from Buka's wife and those close to him. It not only turned out that Rafai was very familiar with the Jersey neighborhood of the Journal Square, having been a visible bodyguard and interpreter for the blind Sheikh Omar Abdel Rahman, but also sometime within that time frame, Rafai ended up possessing blueprints of the World Trade Center that were being thrown away while the FDNY offices he was working in was going through the renovation of city blueprint storage. But Peter Lance, in a C-SPAN interview for Washington Journal in 2004, had also described suspicious activity during the attacks, inferring Middle Eastern foreigners on the ground having something to do with the attacks, thus the destruction of the Twin Towers, when he was questioned by a telephone caller about World Trade Center Building 7. Now, this is something I've never said before. I'm going to say it here for the first time. There is evidence that an individual uh, was walking out of the garage and he was arrested by the NYPD. He was on a cell phone speaking in Arabic. He was wearing a, a turnout coat and boots from, from um, a 10 engine and 10 truck, which is the fire company just below the Trade Center. He was arrested by the NYPD. A fire marshal, uh, Andy DeFusco, that I interviewed, went over to him and went to the processing of the man's arrest. He somehow was down. He was a messenger who was down uh, in the World Trade Center area prior to the first plane hitting. He, as soon as the first plane hit, 10 engine and 10 truck, the door went up. He went in to install a probationary firefighter's coat and boots, and then he somehow found his way into the inside 7 World Trade Center, which is where the city's command center was, and as he was emerging, and he emerged after both buildings had collapsed pristine which clearly meant he was inside that building during both collapse. He's talking on a phone, cell phone in Arabic. He was arrested. The NYPD tried to turn him over to the FBI, and they said, we're not interested. And that is an absolutely true story. His name was Sukru Dal. He claimed to be of Turkish origin. I went to the messenger service that he worked in. They said he had no reason to be there that day, and he basically was given time served, and he's in the wind. But coming back to the article in the New Jersey Advanced Media for NJ.com, looking over the apartment buildings in the Journal Square neighborhood, FBI agents took several residents of the building into custody days later, according to neighbors and an account in the Star Ledger. It's unclear why they were detained. Of course, this would also be inferring to Osmoth and Khan's roommate being detained, which would mean that the 6 Tunnel Avenue apartments would be in large part of the urban myth that there were celebratory incidents of Arab or Muslims in Jersey City on 9-11. Separate whatever details that can be ferreted for Urban Moving Systems celebratory incidents from Serge Kovlaski's WAPO article. What's important to underline here for 9-11 activists, given the advantage of publicity and known controversy coming from who became 45th President of the United States, that when Trump said Muslims or Arabs celebrated in Jersey City as the Twin Towers came down on September 11th, minus the discrepancy of him being incorrect on large numbers, is that it should permanently signify that when the future POTUS spoke of such incidents, they had everything entirely to do, not just with the 9-11 conspiracy, but also with the first attack on the World Trade Center in 1993. Plus, coming out of this Jersey City neighborhood, like the example of a different airport with Flight 23 at JFK in New York, is the prospect of another fifth plane from a New Jersey airport, where an official United Airlines flight is hijacked from, Newark, where suspects Mohammed Osmoth and Ayub Khan also depart on American Airlines Flight 1729, just eight minutes after Flight 93. The Jersey City Journal Square was a hot spot for 9-11, period. Numerous omissions and lies in the 9-11 Commission report exist for anybody who invests taking a lengthy look at immediate news coverage within the crisis and September 11th aftermath. The official story only accounts for hijackers barely entering the country in the last couple of years until the run-up of 9-11. The Jersey City area in Journal Square shows that, as far as justice and protecting the American public at home, from the start of the early 90s, nothing demographically changed in that area as a consequence of the first Trade Center bombing investigations to have prevented September 11th from occurring. The attacks of September 11th are proof that the 1993 bombing was an unsolved crime. We need to realize that if it was a cover-up for explosives, cover-up in the hijacking operations, 
or cover-up for additional terrorist and hijacker accomplices, or whether it was cover-ups with Israelis as suspects, the point being about all that we've raised thus far in these parts in the film series is that all these issues of investigatory corruption and neglect was virtually buried within the rubble at Ground Zero. Perhaps you might understand much clearer now that Trump was right when he says to reporters and news anchors refusing to take him seriously or find legitimacy in his claims do so under this notion that profiling such communities or celebrations after 9-11 is not considered politically correct. The bottom line? A larger operation was going on there than what authorities and officials have told us, and under the radar for eight and a half years. Regardless of how informed Trump actually was when he made his truthful statement to his version of Jersey celebrations, as previous reference to permanence, every time we're reminded of him defending it and allegedly making fun of Serge Kavlaski's appearance is specifically over an evidentiary WAPO article Kavlaski wrote in September 17, 2001, which vindicated some celebratory incidents in defense of Trump's version, uncovers a larger scale conspiracy for all to see and are not blind and ignorant. Kavlaski's WAPO article, as far as leads or indicators that weren't followed up on, these Jersey City celebratory revelations are the echoes of not just 1993, but when included with the circumstances Osmoth and Khan, it's also the echoes or maybe even the birthplace of the Bojinka plot. And what do we make of Osmoth and Khan's original destination on American Airlines Flight 1729 from Newark to Texas, considering the early warning sign from Marsha Kramer at 10.53 and 11.03 a.m. when she believed eight planes were already targeted? Was NORAD after their flight or alerted to it for some reason into Dulles Airport and or the Texas area, considering how scattered they were intercepting other aircraft later that were not responding to the FAA's national grounding? We will have a bit more about this in the next part, but there's still more that we need to cover in these angles. In part four, we will continue on Trump at the end of his term and after. But more importantly, analyze and expose the Alex Jones and Infowars operation, challenging the origins of their shadow government narrative of September 11 and his conspiracy and historical idiocracies. For many of the problems we face today, not just as 9-11 truth and accountability seekers, but as the problem for the moment we've arrived to, with the disinformation ecosphere or sewer we call alternative media. Perhaps the next coming part might enlighten you as we analyze the rumors, myths, and conspiracies between the Republican presidencies, dynasty, and campaigns of George W. Bush and Donald J. Trump, as well as other foreign leaders, officials, in the pre- and post-September 11 era we still live in today, as we continue to revisit some of the problematic early news reports from the morning of 9-11 and lots more. But if you want to get an early preview of the next series of Urban Truth or 9-11 Myths and help financially, then please consider becoming a Patreon to also get special special updates, and other original content pertaining to 9-11. Thank you for watching this film. Please continue to part four and also subscribe to my channels. I'm referring to the reports about the arrests at Kennedy and at LaGuardia Airport this afternoon. Have you heard them? Yes. Yeah, yes, I have. Did you hear them before we reported them? I, uh, I, 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 <laughs> the answer is I didn't hear about the arrest. I heard the, about the prospects of the arrest, yes. Do you believe that there is a continuing effort by some people to get at, in broad language, the United States tonight, and the details of these reports today are accurate, and therefore, how worried should the country be? I think that there will be and are people who will attempt to continue to get at the country. I do not believe that the prospect of that occurring is very high for two reasons. One, I think it's, you're talking about, in effect, the second team. What, what, what leads you, Senator, to say that these arrests at Kennedy and LaGuardia today may have been the second team? Um, I, I, I don't think I can respond to that.